Good morning, Crossview. It's great to have you here once again. We know that there is still a lot of confusion. Businesses are beginning to open up. Restaurants are beginning to serve once again. But we need to be wise, and we need to be safe in what we do. The great thing about being a believer in Jesus Christ is that we have his guidance and his wisdom. And so we are praying for each one of you. We continue to pray for our church, continue to pray for friends and family, continue to pray for first responders, for the healthcare workers, because they continue to put their lives at risk to minister to others. So today we're going to have an awesome time of worship and an awesome message and we invite you to share in this time, and we ask that, that the Holy Spirit just guide and bless this time this morning. And we're going to have a reading as we begin the service this morning. So this first song is called The Blessing, and it's taken right from Scripture. If you look at Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26, it says, The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. And that blessing is from God over us each of us, our families, our children, even on into our children's children. The Lord bless you and keep you his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. Before you and behind you 
and beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you, He is with you, in the morning, in the evening, in the coming, and you're going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are will 
Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with the perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The cross has the final word The cross has the final word Sorrow may come in the darkest night But the cross has the final word The cross has the final word The cross has the
peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still every wave at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence me. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, you do make the darkness tremble. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are our Lord, our Savior, our God. You conquered the grave. You conquered sin and death. You have freed your people eternally from their sin by your sacrifice on the cross. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are God. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, and you will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory and praise of the Father. And it's to you we pray now. Amen and amen. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, Crossview Church, and to all who may be listening or watching as we have the service online today. You know, I think in this country we're up for some good news. We've had some bad news for several weeks, or even a couple of months now. And if you turn on the TV, it's not even that much about the coming election, but it's all about COVID-19. We as human beings enjoy good news, and there are special moments in our life where we get to experience that. Personally, as our high school graduation, or maybe even college, landing our first real job. I know one of the highlights of my life was when Debbie actually said, I do. The birth of our children was a big time and a very important time in our life. 
but four news events that are listed in the Bible and given to us biblically stand out as infinitely larger than any other event the world has ever seen. The announcement of Jesus' birth. Imagine being a shepherd. They weren't really high on the social totem pole at that time. Imagine being a shepherd out there keeping watch over the sheep, and the angel came, and of course they were scared, who wouldn't be? But then they said, don't be afraid, because they got the best news ever. The Savior of the world is going to be born in Bethlehem. And they were so excited about that, they forgot all about tending the sheep. The Bible says they left their flocks and went to Bethlehem. I think of the ladies who went to the tomb of Jesus on the morning of his resurrection and found that he wasn't there, just like he said he would be resurrected. Imagine their excitement as they probably screamed, he's not here, but he's risen. Another event hasn't happened yet. Event number three is the rapture, when Jesus will descend and we will be caught up to meet him in the air. The fourth event that we're going to talk about today once more in our last of a series is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, events one to three were about Jesus and what he would do. But interestingly enough, event four was told by Jesus to his disciples. And so, in the past couple of weeks and this week, we're looking at three questions. Who is the Holy Spirit? How will he come? And today we're going to look at what will he do. And so in part one, we considered who or what is the blessing, meaning the Holy Spirit. In part two, how do I get the blessing? And today, we will look more deeply at the blessing of the blessing, taking a closer look at his function. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible tells us that the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Now, a guarantee is given as proof of a blessing that is yet to come. It's something tangible that is saying, because you have this, you can look forward to that. A will is a form of a guarantee. It's definitely talking about, as the scripture said, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised. So a will is kind of proof that you have an inheritance coming if you're the recipient. Generally, it's what is given to someone when we die, usually to members of our family, as a possession. Now, we paid for the benefits that will be received from our will. Could be life insurance, could be savings accounts, could be investments. With his precious and innocent blood, Jesus has paid for the inheritance that we will receive when we die. It's interesting that a physical will benefits those who are still alive when a loved one dies. However, dying physically is the avenue which enables us to have God's inheritance. Now, there are many, many verses of Scripture, just as we affirm the future inheritance to our loved ones in the form of a will, with God in many verses of Scripture affirm the inheritance that awaits for us in heaven. Probably the best-known verse in all the world is John 3.16. And many of us watching today could probably say that verse without having to read it. We probably have it memorized. I don't know how many times in my life I've said it, but I, was, but I was praying before the Lord this week about my message, about what he would have me speak about this aspect of the Holy Spirit. The thought came to me, how many times have I dissected that verse and really understood what the verse was saying? We know that it says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish or die in their sins, but will have everlasting life. And so as I began to look at this verse more deeply this week, which is part of the promise that is mentioned in, in that verse in Ephesians 1.14, God so loved. There are a lot of little words in the English language that are really quite huge. And one of those words is so. God so loved. If he hadn't so loved us, 
He might not have been willing to do what he did, but he so loved us. He loved us with a love that we can't even describe or even fathom as the love of God. In 1750, a prisoner in a jail cell etched a poem. I don't know if he wrote it or, or, he, or he, it was something that he had memorized, but he etched a poem on the concrete wall of the jail that he was staying in. Almost 200 years later, in 1948, a man named Frederick Lehman came across this same poem, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write a song about the love of God. And so he did. And every verse is powerful. But the third verse has impacted my life when I think about how God so loved the world. It says, if we, could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Now, if you're under 100 years old today, you may not recognize those words too well. They're pretty archaic, the words to this song. So I'm going to put it in a vernacular that hopefully we can all get the point of what this songwriter and this person who etched the poem so many years ago meant. Imagine if every ocean was filled with ink and if all the sky was nothing but paper to write on and if every blade of grass on earth was a pen. And you have to understand, you who are younger today, that a pen wasn't always a pen. A pen wasn't always something that you just hit the top and wrote as long as you wanted to. But a pen when I was growing up, and I know this is centuries ago, but a pen when I was growing up, was in a, the ink was in a bottle, and it sat on the desk, and you had a little lever kind of thing on the fountain pen, and when you opened it, you could put it in the bottle, and it would fill up with ink, and when you ran out of ink, you had to do it again. And so Frederick Lehman was considering this kind of pen that needed to be refilled when he wrote these songs. So imagine if, instead of a bottle, the ocean was what held your ink all the oceans, and all the skies were paper, and all the, all the blades of grass were those fountain pens. To write the love of God on the paper in the sky would drain all those oceans dry. Nor could the paper, even if you could write it, it couldn't contain all about the love of God. And so today, when it says God so loved the world, we can't even fathom how much that love we may have experienced it, but we can't fathom how far it reaches, and we can't understand with our human minds how, how much it is, because it says he loved the world. Now, throughout the ages, there have been always been many more who were unwilling to accept God's gift of salvation than those who received the gift. In that regard, he also knew the rebellious and disobedient manner in which unbelievers would live their lives, yet he allowed the blood of Jesus, his only son, to be given for them as well. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He didn't have to do it. He wasn't coerced to do it. It wasn't an obligation on his part, but he gave willingly Jesus to die for our sins. He had already created at the very beginning of time a perfect sinless world with only one restriction placed on the people he'd created. And all they had to do was obey, and Jesus would never have needed to give his life. When Adam and Eve sinned, God could have said, well, you blew it, so you're on your own. And that would have been the same for every other person who was born, and it would have been what we all deserved. But God so loved the world that he gave not just anyone, but he gave his only son. If mankind was ever going to be redeemed, God had to send the only one who was capable of giving a life that would pay for every person's sin. Now, I might be willing to give you the shirt off my back, so to speak, but giving you the life of any of my children so that you could live when you, if you deserve to die, that's another story. In that scenario, even more amazing than the fact that my children are sinners too and don't deserve God's salvation while Jesus was completely perfect and had done nothing to deserve the pain and suffering he would have to endure so that we would be saved. So he so loved the world that whosoever, he not only gave his, his one and only son, but that whosoever 
That word whosoever, what a huge word. This morning, I'm thankful that I'm one of the whosoevers. And if you know Jesus, you're one of the whosoevers. God gave Jesus so that no matter how many sins I committed, no matter how many times I turned my back on him, no matter how many times I encouraged others to live a life apart from God, no matter how many times I put my own physical life in jeopardy, which could have caused my physical death when I didn't know the Lord. He spared me and waited until I gave my heart to him. He truly is unwilling that any should die in their sins. So if the whosoever believes, that whosoever believes in him, only one requirement, didn't require any of us to be Moses or Paul or Billy Graham or any of the other hundreds of thousands of saints who have been champions of the faith and led many others to know him. All we had to do was accept his sacrifice and trust his blood for forgiveness and believe in his resurrection to have eternal life instead of dying in our sins. And for all those who believe, they will not perish. They will not have to pay the penalty for our sins that we so richly deserve. I tend to think that I'm a pretty good person. Probably wasn't as hard to die for me as someone who has committed murder or some other terrible crime. But when I think of how many times I failed to follow his will, lashed out in anger, selfishly chosen my way without regard for God's will, I know that I, as Paul said, am the chiefest of sinners. Yet, because of the blood of Jesus, I will not suffer what I deserve, but have everlasting life. So in the verse in Ephesians, it says that the Spirit is our guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised through John 3, 16 and the other verses that talk about accepting Christ as Savior and him dying and rising again. And that he has purchased, it says, he's purchased for everyone to be his own people. 1 Peter 8, 1 Verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the, plesh, the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God didn't just make an offer and then rescind it because the price was too high. Because he cares for us and loves us so much, he followed through with his promise. It says that he purchased this for every one. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that God showed his love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. With everything we've done to disqualify us from living in his eternal heaven, God did what was necessary to include us in his family. Aren't you thankful today? As much as I love you, you're not in my will. Only Debbie's listed. And when we both go to heaven, the recipients are our children. But God's inheritance was given with the intent that everyone who has ever lived would be the beneficiary. He loves all people with a love that supersedes all others, a love that is beyond our capability to understand. And his inheritance of heaven, however, can only be applied to those who have believed in and trusted the blood of Jesus to save them from their sins. So God built a house for us next door to him and then paid the price so we could live there. Finally, this verse says he did this so we would praise and glorify him. He did this to enable us not only to receive forgiveness of, his sin, of our sins, but through our connection with the Holy Spirit, we have, our lives have the capability of displaying his splendor. Yes, his splendor, his majesty, to live as God planned, to act with the same traits as God himself by living life in the Spirit. He didn't enable us to have his life in us just so that we could bask in the blessing of it, although that's a huge part of the blessing. But he also gave us the Holy Spirit to be able to live as Jesus lived so that others could see the incredible blessing that comes from having him in our lives and that they would desire him also. Once the Holy Spirit has taken residence in our life, the natural response, once he comes to us and convicts us, the natural response is to not only ask his forgiveness, and accept him as Savior, but as he dwells within us, to follow him obediently and faithfully in gratitude and love. Anyone who says they have received Jesus and thereafter deliberately lives a life of total disobedience has, according to the word of God, never been saved. It's impossible to have the blessing of the Holy Spirit in your life 
and the result to have no effect on your speech, your attitude, your values and behavior. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He's the spirit of truth. He reveals truth in any matter, regardless of the circumstances. Because he's the spirit of God, he cannot reveal anything but truth. And he is here to guide, to lead, to show the way into all truth, each and every part of truth. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, what's the subject. We just need to engage him and, and be led by him to be able to make the right decision, whether it's, whether it's making a large pur a purchase, changing jobs, moving to another location, managing your health, choosing which college for your children to go to, how to respond to another's negative behavior. He reveals God's truth, and his plan for us is to live in obedience to it. He reveals the knowledge and insight of the word of the truth to us and makes it come alive. There's no other truth needed. No other man can drive, contrives revelation is valid. I was teaching this uh, passage of scripture, John 16, 13, one night to a youth group on a Wednesday night. And you always get those who find those obscure circumstances in their minds that, that, that invalidate the fact that he is the giver of all truth. So this young boy that was in high school raised his hand. I don't know how, what he made as far as grades are concerned, but he raised his hand and he said, well, what about this? Is there anything about how to do trigonometry in the Bible? And I said, not that I know of. And he said, so how is he going to guide me into the truth of what the correct answer of the problem is? And I said, well, I'll tell you how. I said, first of all, when you go to school, you need to listen to the teacher strongly, not be trying to read some other book or do something different while he's talking or she's talking. You need to listen to the teacher, first of all, and you need to take notes. And then when you go home, you need to do your homework because trigonometry is not something you do 15 problems a day. It takes time to do a problem. And you need to take, you need to take it home and, and be able to do your homework. And then when you know you're going to be evaluated on a test or quiz or whatever, you know, if you know the Lord, you need to just pray. And even when you're studying, you need to pray every day and read your Bible every day. But mostly when you're studying that, you need to pray and ask God to give you the insight to know the answer. And I tell you what, if you pray to the Holy Spirit and ask him to help you with your problems with trigonometry, he will. And it'll make a difference. And if you're an E student or an F student, you probably won't make an A, but you'll probably make something better than an F. You will make something better than an F. So my whole point on that is that we can always find these obscure situations to say, to try to invalidate, but the Bible says that the Spirit, that the, that the, that the Word is truth, and the Spirit is the truth of that Word. And He, can, he conveys that truth to us, and He will. And i got to tell you, folks, I know that in my life, I've prayed for, for the answers to some unusual questions, and God always leads me through the Holy Spirit. All of God's truth was lived in the person of Jesus Christ. Today we have all of God's truth in his word, which cannot be added to or subtracted from. We have the guide who teaches us how to apply God's truth in the person of the Holy Spirit. This verse of scripture in John 16, 13 says he won't speak on his own. The Spirit speaks to our hearts through Scripture. He speaks to our hearts through His leading in our lives. He speaks to our hearts through the faithful witness and guidance of other committed believers. His leading in our lives is not designed to grow stale. When we moved to uh, Georgia, we had several couples there in Michigan that we were close to. And for a while, we called them a lot, we wrote a lot, they came to see us sometimes all the way from there. When we went to see our family, we made sure we stopped by their house and saw them. But over time, the communication became less frequent. And pretty soon we had gone several years without seeing them. And one particular couple was a great blessing last summer, and, and actually twice, uh, twice last year we got to see them uh, while we were there. And it was, it was really a blessing to see that our thought our feeling for each other hadn't changed but the point is we went all that time we didn't know really what they for sure looked like we didn't know what their kids looked like had grown up and and got and gotten married and were adults and the point is that in that time that we were apart 
We didn't communicate a lot. We didn't really know what was going on. Their lives were not really impacting our lives. Our lives were not impacting their lives. And the Holy Spirit is not designed to be put on the back burner and just hang around until you need him. His words are not of his own initiative. His thoughts to us, his agenda for us is not secluded, not separated to himself because he speaks in total harmony with the commands and thoughts of God. We need to hear from him every day, every moment of every day. We need to be connected with him 24-7 because he cannot speak anything to us that is not in complete agreement with God the Father. And so this verse goes on to say he will tell you what he's heard, what he has perceived, what he has comprehended and understood from the Father. He can never tell us anything that will be in contradiction to what God says. And he will even give us insight and wisdom and guidance and direction for future events. He came to live in the apostles' hearts, and he told them about how to do their ministry. And today he impresses our hearts regarding things we need to plan, as well as things we are planning that need to be omitted or changed in some way. And that's why at Crossview Church, when the elders meet, when the praise team practices, when I'm studying, when we meet with any group of people, we pray and pray and pray. That comes not just from my leadership, but in great power from all the leaders of our church. On Wednesday nights when we, pre when we meet, it's all about prayer. We say hello to each other, but we don't get in long conversations. We don't do a lesson, we pray. In Sunday school classes, we pray. Because of that, God has some amazing things in store for Crossview, things that we cannot even imagine. Why, because we're good? No, because we pray. And pray, praying invokes the power of God. James 5, 16 says, the effectual sincere prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. No matter how committed to this ministry we may think we are, the best of our plans and commitment cannot come close to matching what happens when we go to the Lord continually in prayer, desiring to get the answer from the Lord and to obey what he has said. So the Holy Spirit confirms the prophecy of the word in our hearts to help us believe it. All other prophecy is man's speculation. Only God's revealed prophecy is reliable. The prophecy is God's plan for the future the revealed Word of God. Think of all the times in the Bible when things were prophesied hundreds of years before they were to take place, but at the perfect time, those prophecies came true just as they were enunciated many years before. I think about the book of Isaiah, which blesses my heart every time I read it, especially those parts where it says that Jesus would be born of a virgin. Unless you are wondering about that, that's kind of a rare event. And yet, 700 years later, it came true. About the second coming of Christ, the new heaven and the new earth that we read about in Revelation. Isaiah even, even said that he, he would suffer stripes from being beaten. And then it says, by his stripes, we are healed. He would be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I'm sure to human eyes, if anyone visited him besides the shepherds and the wise men in that, in that stable where he was born, they didn't look to him to be the Prince of Peace, but he was. When we read about future events, such as the rapture, the second coming of Christ, the new heaven, the new earth, the Spirit excites us, our hearts, as he confirms the truth of what we have just read. The Bible is full of promises, and the Holy Spirit not only helps us to believe them, but to follow them with a faith that is passionate and unrelenting. And so, the final scripture verse today uh, reminds us that the Holy Spirit and his word to us leaves nothing out. John 14, 26 says, when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, Jesus is talking here, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I've told you. So when God sent the helper, the comforter, the guide, the truth giver, under the authority of Jesus Christ to speak to us, to guide us in the place of Jesus, who was going to rise and, and, go, and go back to be with his Father. He was going to, the Holy Spirit is, is to impart instruction, to teach us, to instill doctrine, to explain and expound the truth. It says that he will remind us of everything. He will teach us and remind us of everything that Jesus has told us when he was here on earth. Everything. The Holy Spirit active 
in our hearts, there doesn't have to be anything left of speculation. Everything we need to know in every area of life is included in the Word of God, and we'll be, and we'll be affirmed in our hearts as truth through the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And then I like this part. It says he'll remind you of everything. He'll remind you of everything in case we forget. You know, uh, I don't like to admit that I don't remember things as well as I used to. But the truth is, I don't think I do remember things quite as well as I used to. But I'm so glad that even if I forget some things that don't matter, I can go to the Holy Spirit and he will remind me of the things I need to know because he's the power of God inside us today. He reminds us of the words, the life of Jesus Christ and the commands of God the Father. So the question for us today as believers is not do we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, but what are we allowing him to do as a result? Are we living life on our own, even squelching the guidance of the Holy Spirit when the word or his leading in our hearts is attempting to lead us to commit ourselves to an area of service that we feel uncomfortable doing? Do I make excuses like Moses or run the other way like Jonah or just flat out refuse to follow him? If you know the Lord today, the Spirit lives inside you. And the most blessed, fulfilling, and amazing life is waiting for all of us if we will only listen and obey. Maybe today you're here and you really don't relate to what I've been talking about because you've never come to a place in your heart and life where you encountered the Lord Jesus, admitted that you're a sinner and ask him to forgive you from your sins and give you eternal life. Sometimes I think people that have not done this think it's a complicated thing, but really it's not. In fact, the story behind it and the activity of doing it is actually quite easy to understand. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't think anyone who's watching this video would say honestly today that they've never done anything wrong. All have sinned. In Romans 6.23, it tells us that the wages of sin or the payment for that sin, because God is perfect, the payments for that sin is death, eternal death. But that's another little word that is huge. But the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God is not just something to fix it. It's eternal life in Christ our Lord. And then once again, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, will not die in their sins, but have everlasting life. And the way to do that, it's very simple. John 1, 12 said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So today, would you bow with me as we, would you bow with me as we, as we go in prayer to consider the claims of God and the Holy Spirit on our lives? If you have never prayed to receive Christ as your Savior. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. So if you know you've never done that, this could be and probably is right now the most important moment of your life. You may have heard other messages before, but every time you hear the story of the gospel, it's one more opportunity for you to embrace it and know that your sins are forgiven and that your eternal destiny is secure. So I'm asking you right now, if you know that you have not received Jesus, would you just go to him right now with your heart and just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that the blood of Jesus paid for my sins. I believe that he rose from the dead to give me eternal life. Would you please forgive me and come into my life today. And in faster than you can blink your eyes, you will be forgiven and you will have possession 
of, of eternal life forever. And the Holy Spirit will come to live inside your life to affirm that. I'm going to give you some time right now. Some quiet time. To go before the Lord. I beg you, if you have never received Christ today, it's the day God has planned for you to be hearing this and to be responding to it. Would you do it today? Lord Jesus, as believers today, we want to thank you and praise you and tell you how much we love you for the gift of eternal life, for the blessing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to be able to have you living inside us, responding to our needs, listening to our prayers, helping us make decisions. And Father, if there are believers in the audience today who are not living life for you, I pray that you would bring conviction to their hearts and restore them back to that time when they first came to know you and the joy and peace that was there. Help them, Father, to be committed to living life for you and you alone. Father, I pray for those who may have received Jesus, that you would help them to know that what they did today is truth. What they did today is receive you as their personal Savior and the gift of eternal life. And Father, I pray you'd help them to get connected with the ministry that can provide growth for them, encouragement to them as they walk through life with you. And Father, today, as we get ready to close the service, I pray, Father, that you would bless us as we leave this place, as we live life in our homes and wherever we have to go. I pray we would not fret over despair over the COVID-19 situation. But Father, help us to look for opportunities to share our faith with others. Help us to be a blessing to those around us. Help us to show, us to show confidence and assurance because we have you. The worst that could happen to us in this life is the best thing that could happen to us for eternity. We love you today. We give you all praise and glory. Would you please take this message and bless it for your honor and glory. We commit all these things to you, and we love you today in Jesus' name. Amen. As our closing of the service today, we are once again going to prayerfully sing the blessing. <laughs>